It was in November of 2014 when five-year-old Tiffany, eight-year-old Ryan, and nine-year-old Allen were brutally murdered. Two more bodies would add to this list, making a total number of five brutal deaths. When investigations began, the revelations on who committed these crimes and why would shock an entire nation. This is the case of the Mago family. Hi friends, welcome back to the Ayira Faith channel. I am Ayira and I post true crime videos every true crime Tuesdays. So if that's your kind of vibe, please consider subscribing. Today's case is of the tragic death of the Magu family. We begin our story in Nyandarwa County. It is the 21st of November 1979 when Lydia Wangui is born to parents Francis Ndau and Mary Modoni. Lydia is the last of nine children and is adored by most. Her parents, being religious, raised their children in church and encouraged acts of service to God. So Lydia was not only God-fearing but very bright as well. All through her primary and high school years, Lydia attracted praise from her teachers and envy from her peers. But Lydia always remained humble. She went on to pursue higher studies at Kenyatta University and graduated in 2002. She soon after secured a job with Kenya Shell Petrol Station and it was during her time working here that Lydia met the most charming and handsome young man, Paul Magu. Born on 7th April 1979, Paul was only six months older than Lydia. Magu had just graduated from law school in 2001 and was now at the Kenya School of Law pursuing his postgraduate diploma. The two had a lot in common, but central to this was their love for God. They started dating and quickly fell in love, marrying at Our Lady of Peace Catholic Church in South Bay, Nairobi on January of 2005. Married life was good. The couple was deeply in love and Paul showered his wife with a lot of gifts and presents as a show of his undying love. As a result, their first child came that very same year, 2005, a handsome little boy they named Allen Mohiu. Their second son wasn't far behind and arrived in 2006. They named him Ryan Dao after Lydia's father. However, having two kids under two proved to be quite a challenge for the couple and they decided to take some time and concentrate on raising the two boys they had before expanding their family. They had always wanted a daughter and God would answer their prayers on the 9th of July 2009 when Tiffany Wambui Magu was born. The family of five couldn't be happier. In fact, Paul's legal practice was doing very well and the couple had started a real estate business. They also lived at Garden Estate, one of Nairobi's well-to-do areas, and owned several vehicles and several pieces of property. In 2007, however, Paul Magu had met one Ann Wambui Wanyoro, a self-proclaimed pastor and prophet. At the time, the family worshipped at FEM, Faith Evangelical Ministries, but a year after meeting Ann, Paul moved the family to her church, Showers of Praise. The church did not have a permanent location and they would worship anywhere Anne chose. Also, the church didn't conduct sermons on Sundays like normal churches did. Anne insisted on having them midweek, which was strange to Lydia, but her husband Paul insisted that there was nothing wrong with that. The church had also not been registered in accordance with the laws of Kenya. As the months went by, Paul grew closer and closer to Anne, even offering and paying her son's school fees to allow Anne quit her day job to focus entirely on preaching. Slowly but surely, Paul started selling off property he owned and giving the money to either Anne or her church, despite his wife's protests. He even bought Anne a car and when she was involved in a car accident, he took her to hospital, paid the entire hospital bill, when she was discharged, he took her to his house to recuperate and even bought her a new car. Soon his wife and extended family noticed worrying changes in Paul's behavior. His mother met Anne and Paul several times in compromising positions and places and when she cautioned her son, he cut her off from his life completely. Then came 2010 when Paul, on Anne's advice, 
quit his job and close down his farm to become a full-time pastor at Anne's church. His wife would complain to relatives about the amount of time and money Paul spent on Anne, but every time anyone tried to intervene, Paul would harshly rebuke them and cut them off entirely from his life. Soon his children were not allowed to mingle or play with other kids, and his wife had no friends. Even her sisters were kept away. Soon Anne started visiting the household often, and she would eventually be permanently assigned a room in the Magu household. There was also a prayer room set aside that only Paul and Anne would visit and spend hours in. Anne would live in the Magu household as if it was her own home, and Paul would listen to no one but Anne, not even his wife Lydia. For four days, from November 16th to November 19th of 2004, Anne stayed with the Magus and performed some cultist rituals in the prayer room with Paul. Come Sunday, November 23rd, 2014, the family had breakfast together served by their house help. Mrs. Magu then sent Joki, their house help, out to buy a bottle of soda. When she returned, Paul sent her back out again to buy sour porridge flour at a specific shop very far from the home. When Joki questioned why she was to go that far yet she could get the same at the kiosk just outside the gate, Paul told her that he wanted flour from that specific shop because their products were authentic. Joki left and returned a while after only to see Paul speaking to the neighbor. That evening, Tiffany, the youngest child, asked for her mother and Paul told her that her mother was away praying with Pastor Anne and will be back very late. The family went to bed. The next morning, Monday 24th November 2014, Lydia was not yet back home. And so the day came and went. On Tuesday 25th November 2014, Paul asked Joki the house help to prepare the children as he wanted to take them out. Joki saw him filling some forms and writing a note. Being worried, she tried to convince the children to stay at home with her, but the kids were too excited and refused. Schools were on holiday and they wanted to have some fun with their dad. At 10 a.m., Paul left with his children in the family car. At noon, he was back at home and told Joki that he had come to pick an item. But he was alone. The children were not with him. He soon left thereafter and went to his parents' home in Thika. Meanwhile, Police had been called to Paradise Lost, a recreational site along Kiambu Road and had recovered a body in a sack. At his parents' home, Paul met his dad. His mom was away visiting his sister in Mombasa. His dad prepared tea to welcome him, but Paul took only two sips and rejected the tea. When his father left for the farm, Paul followed him but behaved strangely the whole time. He would stare talk to himself and walk around in circles. That evening, when Paul's father prepared dinner, Paul refused to eat and said that he was to meet some friends for a fundraising event and that he would be back later that day. He left on foot and came back at 11 p.m. soaking wet. He told his dad he had been attacked by thieves who stole his phone and pushed him in the river. On the morning of Wednesday, 26 November 2014, Paul's father comes back from the shop carrying milk and eggs to prepare breakfast for his son. He finds Paul wearing his mother's clothes. He angrily shouts at him to take them off and gives Paul his own clothes. Paul takes off his mother's clothes and puts on his father's clothes, then drives off. His father, being worried, calls his other son Andrew, Paul's brother, and tells him that Paul is acting strange and that Andrew should follow him to see if he was okay. Andrew tries to call his brother but he can't reach him so he goes to his house where he meets Lydia's family. He also meets an unexpected visitor, Pastor Anne, and she tells him to check Lydia and Paul's bedroom. This was strange but Andrew gets the bedroom keys from the house help and enters the bedroom. They noticed that the sheets had been removed from the bed and there were blood spatters on the ceiling, the walls and the floor. There were also pieces of bone on the floor. They realized that something horrible must have happened. Pastor Anne, I remember we were at the kitchen door living, and she told me, uh, go check the bedroom. So I told the house girl to give me the keys to the bedroom. She, uh, funny enough, they were there. It was no longer just a case of a missing person. Something worse had happened to Lydia Margo. The bedroom looked okay, very clean. 
but on a closer look we started seeing fragments of bone around and, and uh, I think some a little blood splashed on the, on the ceiling. First thing we see it's blood all over and there are some pieces of bones which we later discovered were, were her teeth. On Thursday, November 27, 2014, Andrew approaches the service desk at Thika police station to report his brother and his family missing. But he sees his brother's car parked outside and on inquiring, he is told that his brother walked in front of a bus on the Thika highway yesterday and was killed on the spot. His car was found on the side of the highway with the engine still running and his children's jacket on the back seat. Police then visit the Magu home and find ashes in the parking lot in the shape of a human being lying on their back. They remember the unidentified body collected at Paradise Lost on Tuesday and that the body would later be identified as Lydia Magu. She had been viciously cut up on her face and neck and had been beaten so badly her teeth were missing. These were the bones the family had seen in the bedroom. She had also been severely burned. In the house, police found Paul Magu's phone and in the prayer room, several spiritual materials that included teachings on curses, misery and wealth. They also found CDs and books on murder, specifically this book called Murder Most Fall, which speaks on ritualistic killings and disposal of bodies. When the neighbor was questioned, he said that on Sunday Paul had asked him for the details on his national identification card so that he could put him down as, the, as his children's custodian. The neighbor had refused. This was the exchange the house help had seen when she had come back to the house after getting flour requested by Paul. They also found a suicide note written by Paul to his parents and siblings, apologizing and informing them that he had left his children in the custody of his neighbor. On Monday, December 1st, 2014, the body of a young child is found in a thicket near Tatu City and the body is identified as that of five-year-old Tiffany. On December 3rd, 2014, the bodies of her brothers Ryan and Allen are found not far from where Tiffany's body was found. Their bodies had been decapitated and had deep cuts on the back of their heads. They had also been burnt with acid. And uh, those ones were badly... They were actually not bodies. We collected bones. Because what was remaining of one kid, I think, was just a, a one leg. Uh, I think their heads had been cut off. The th throats had been slit. Because the, the heads and the body were really quite kind of kind of. And it's like they had been, uh, uh, maybe some acid or something corrosive had been poured on the body. And I think there wasn't enough to pour on the girl. Because of the girl, only part of the face was disfigured. Maybe the acid got finished or something. And I think I can say that at that point we got some relief because it was very depressing. And I think uh, now we knew there's nothing else, else left to look for. Investigations began and the police soon arrested Pastor Ann Wanyoro. It was shown that she was in constant communication with Paul Mago from the day he killed his wife until the last day when he took his own life. Paul had also left 90% of his property to her in his will. The other 10% was left to the neighbor who he had intended to leave his children to. It seems that Paul, with the encouragement of Pastor Anne, through the cult she had led, had brutally bludgeoned his wife to death on Sunday morning. He then attempted to leave his kids with his neighbor, but when his neighbor refused, he made up his mind to kill them. Under the pretense of taking them out, he hacked his children on the back of their heads and then decapitated them before pouring acid all over their bodies. He dumped their bodies on the 2,500 acre plot named Tatu City and went home, presumably to say goodbye to his parents. But Pastor Anne had one last assignment for him, and that was to kill himself. He stepped in front of a bus the very next day and was crushed to death. Pastor Anne is still on trial for the assisted murder-suicide and brainwashing of Paul Mago and his family. Paul and Lydia were 35 years old when they died. Their children, 5, 8 and 9 respectively. The family was buried together in one grave on Tuesday 9th December 2014 in an emotional ceremony that left many hearts broken. May the Mago family rest in perfect peace. See you next time for my next video.